Hey y'all, it's Bridget Moses from Vincent and Bridget Moses Godly Encouragement here with some more Godly Encouragement for you today. Today we're talking on 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 25 through 27 in the ESV version, which says, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. First of all, I got to tell you, I got a refresher course in this recently. And sometimes we get tempted with things that are so very, very, very close to where we feel like God is leading us to go. And if we're not careful, we'll take on those things thinking that that is God's will for us because it so closely um, embodies everything that we're feeling led to do by God in the first place. If we're not prayerful and we don't ask God first, then we will fail. Um, because if it's not God's will for us, it might be something good. It might be something really, really good. But if it's not God's will for us, then it's not going to be good for us. At least not now in this season. We have to be very careful because um, if Satan can't stop us, he will try to distract us in any way possible. That's exactly what happened with me over the past week or so. Um, and I failed. I, I dropped the ball because I made a commitment that I did not seek God on first because it was so close to what I knew I was supposed to do. It actually kind of wrapped a lot of things that I felt like God was leading me to do into one, um, thing. And I didn't honor that commitment because I wasn't able to. Um, because right now in this season, um, it wasn't the right time for me to do that. And so I got a whole um, real life example, um, a real time, I guess, not real life, but real time uh, refresher course on the very thing I am teaching on today. So just know that that will happen. And when that happens... What do you do? You get back up. You are accountable for your actions. You examine yourself. You repent to God. And you move forward. Because there's no condemnation. There's no shame. And God has all the grace and the mercy in the world when we repent. When we, when we repent. When we really, um, when God knows that we are really trying to do things the best, um, his best for us. Um, he knows our heart and he knows that, um, you know, we will make mistakes, but we get back up and we do it again. We, we, we move forward. We don't allow that to slow us down because the biggest thing that the enemy would love is for me to go, well, I can't teach on that because I just kind of erred in that area, um, just recently. But that's exactly the point. That's exactly what he would love for me to do is just be like, nope, I'm not qualified to teach this message. But guess what? I'm actually more qualified because I've understood things on a deeper level going through that again uh, recently. So having said that, um, and, and I had just accepted a challenge um, uh, you know, exercise, you know, staying in God's word, um, uh, which I regularly do. Um, anyways, um, you know, reading a, a book that will edify you, um, that's nonfiction or self-help, um, you know, drinking a gallon of water a day, um, half hour a walk, um, a day, um, you know, 
cleaning up your eating and eating, you know, deciding to eat a, a, a healthier um, way. And the, all those things are fantastic. Um, and I, I am going to practice those things, but picking up the challenge, which was, um, you know, where my focus um, ended up being instead of on where God wanted it to be in this moment right now, in this time in my life, um, that's where I dropped the ball. Um, just so you know, so I'm not leaving any, you know, leaving it too vague and, and letting people fill in the blanks with whatever they want to. Um, that, that's what I, what I did. So self-discipline is never an enjoyable process. Just as when we train our bodies physically, there will be tension, discomfort, soreness, achiness, and even pain. You have to stretch beyond the level of where you were before to see any results. The same goes for us spiritually. It's never enjoyable to submit to discipline spiritually. There will be a level of discomfort, no matter how long we've been walking with God. And I will be the first one to tell you, the longer I walk with God, the more I realize I don't know. <laughs> really, really, because he is so vast. I mean, he's unsearchable. Un, un, he's so big and so much depth and so much flavor and so much um, wonder that we could never never search all of him we can never understand all of him and the more we spend time with him the more we realize we really don't know as much as we thought we did because he's so complex for for a lack of a better word we're always being taken from glory to glory never staying the same or in one place spiritually for very long. As soon as we think we've figured everything out and have a system pinned down, just like I was talking about, God will lead us forward into another level. And that's what I just experienced this past couple of weeks. Um, a different uh, lesson in self-discipline. That way we don't get too reliant and on any particular system or way of seeing and interacting with God, we learn how to rely solely on him. Going through this process can be at the very least uncomfortable and at its worst painful. Um, we're used to doing things a certain way and seeing things, people, and life in a particular way. God has to teach us a whole new way of living a much better way of living, although it may not feel like it as you're learning it. As we're learning it, sometimes it doesn't, it, it doesn't feel that way. It, it feels hard, but it's not. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's just hard for us because it's something new to us. But his way really is easy compared to the world's way of doing stuff. The first step to self-discipline in the kingdom of God is, ironically, the surrendering of self. It is called self-discipline, um, but it's when we surrender ourself that we're able to be disciplined. We surrender ourself and our will to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and then we allow him to teach us how to live. I can't speak for anyone else, but for me... This wasn't the easiest process. I had gotten to be so rooted in self-reliance, pride, and control that digging up those roots took time and effort and learning, to, and learning a continual life of sacrifice and surrender. It hurt. At times, it was excruciating. There were times when I wanted nothing more than to give up. There were even times I got angry with God, and I let him know it. I did not hold back. I let him know that I was not happy with you, and 
um, on a few occasions, I even unloaded on God, telling him how it wasn't fair that I was the only one that he was seeming to work on. And I've used very colorful language towards him at times. And I'm going, I'm still here to tell you, and he's still chosen me. And, and I'm not, I'm not condoning talking to God in any type of way. Um, we need to be honoring and loving and reverent and respectful of him. But I do know that he can handle our emotion. He can handle our flesh. He can handle our anger. He can handle our accusations. And he's the only one that can help us sort them out. Thank God that he's not like people. Thank God he is not like people. He's much stronger. He can take our hurt, our anger, and our frustration. He doesn't take it personally. I've learned that he would much rather for us to be real and authentic with him than to pretend like everything is okay. We keep him from helping us when we deny how we feel. We don't have to stay there, and we shouldn't. But we definitely have to acknowledge how we feel to be able to move forward. I always say that God can't help us quit what we won't admit, and he can't heal what we won't reveal. Until we bring something into the light, it will continue to grow and fester in the dark. The Bible says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's 1 John 1, verse 7 in the ESV. When we keep things hidden in the dark, we keep ourselves stick, sick and stuck by doing so, unintentionally binding God's hands in the process. He already knows how we feel anyways. He already knows. He's the safest place to take the deepest, darkest, even the ugliest parts of ourselves without the fear of judgment, reject, rejection, or condemnation. God wants us to bring those parts of us to him. He's the only one that can come into those areas once we acknowledge them and bring true, lasting healing, transformation, and restoration. He's not afraid or put off by our authenticity. That's right where he wants us to be with him total transparency but he can't do that until we acknowledge it we have to acknowledge it first before he can do anything about it I remember when God was teaching me that he's the safest place that we can run to with everything that concerns us I used to be ashamed of the way I felt thought and behaved I'd allow that to keep me keep me from running to God instead of running Keep, keep me away from running to God instead of running to him immediately. I would allow it to keep me from him instead of running to him. I had allowed my faults and sin to put distance between him and I. He was right there with me, but I was far away from him due to the shame and the guilt. I wish I would have realized sooner that he was the strong tower and safe place that I needed. That if I would just go to him and lay all of the pieces before him, that he would gently put them back together, only without any missing and without looking down on me or condemning me from the areas in which I'd missed it. There have been many pivotal moments along my walk with God. This was one of the most freeing and impactful. I remember sitting one evening in prayer during a time in which I felt like a complete failure. I felt led to lay the things burdening me, the character flaws, bad decisions, and incorrect mindsets that I've developed over time on the altar as a sacrifice unto God. I immediately apologized for even the idea, which I now understand the idea to have come from the Holy Spirit. And I told God that I was sorry for even the thought of giving him such an unworthy sacrifice. I immediately heard God say so clearly in my spirit, not in an audible voice, but it was so clear that it might as well have been one. That's exactly the sacrifice I want. 
and he asked me, what is left on the altar after something is sacrificed? And I responded with saying, ashes. I heard him impressing upon me the thought that, well, how do you think that I give you beauty for ashes? You lay what's been holding you back on the altar before me as a sacrifice, and I give you the beauty in return. That was a powerful experience, y'all. It was so powerful, so powerful. It, one of the most pivotal moments in my walk so far. It all of a sudden became so clear to me that when we willingly and humbly bring our flaws, faults, struggles, and sins to God and lay them on the altar with complete transparency, asking for his help, that he in turn gives us the beauty, healing, wholeness, and restoration that we seek. It may not happen overnight, but he will do it. Sometimes it's instant, and sometimes he purges us of whatever it is over time. We can re uh, rest assured that it is done, no matter which way he chooses to go about it, though. No matter how many more times we fall short in that area, it no longer has a hold on us. The symptoms may still be there, but the power of that problem has been cut off at the root. After the source of that root has been cut off, if God hasn't removed the issue immediately, then we begin the process of God purging us from it. This is most commonly the method God has used in my experience, although he has removed certain issues immediately. Don't let the enemy fool you into submitting once again into bondage. Just because the symptoms are still there, and you still seem to be struggling with the same issues, that doesn't mean that it still has a hold on you. This is where our faith is proven. And the Bible says in Proverbs 24, 16 in the ESV, that for the righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. No matter how many times you fall back into the habit, mindset, or sin, once you've gotten it over to God by con given it over to God by confessing it to him and laying it on the altar. You repent of missing the mark, you receive God's forgiveness, and you receive him cleansing you of all unrighteousness. Then you dust yourself off and get right back up no matter how many times it takes you for the freedom from it to fully manifest. And that's what I was just talking about at the beginning of this video. We have to live a lifestyle of repentance, of self-examination, first of all, first and foremost. Um, we need to be aware of the things that God wants to work on with us. Um, once he, cause he talks in such a still small voice, um, you know, he'll, he'll just give us a little nudge and say, okay, that's not the best thing for you. You want to hand that over to me? And he leaves the ball in our court. He wants us to come to him instead of staying in the comfortable, stay in the familiar. Not that, you know, our dysfunction is comfortable, but he wants us to let it go, to ask for his help, to invite him into that situation. He's not just going to completely just, you know, he's not just going to come in and take it. Um, he wants to work with us in that area. Um, you instantly reject and rebuke any shame, guilt, or condemnation that tries to come in before it takes root, because none of those things are coming from God, not one of them. That's the enemy trying to get you to receive those things and believe that because you're still dealing with these things, that you're still in bondage to them. It takes faith to press past those lies and to reject the imaginations that you're still in bondage to whatever it is. Condemnation is not from God. Correction is from God. Conviction is from God, but not condemnation. Condemnation says you're wrong, you're bad, uh, you're not good, you know, there's something wrong with you. Conviction says what you're doing is not good. What you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is not my best for you. And that's the difference. This is where the verse, so if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed in John 8, 36 comes, from, comes in. The blood of Jesus broke every curse, everyone, every single one, every generational curse, every 
um, everything we picked up through the world, um, everything we have submitted to unwittingly, um, everything, everything, every soul tie, everything. The blood of Jesus broke every curse, bondage, sickness, and iniquity. It broke, I'm going to say that again, the blood of Jesus broke every curse, bondage, sickness, and iniquity. Every last one of them. It doesn't mean that you're not dealing with it, like I said, but the source, the, the root of it has been cut off. It has no power to hold you. We have already been set completely free. The devil has been stripped of all of his authority, every last bit of it, and has already been defeated. The only way that he can make anything happen is by deceiving us into believing that we're still in bondage. And by doing so, getting us to yield our God-given authority to him. When Jesus ascended out of hell after paying the debt for our sin, he took with him the keys to hell and the grave and all authority was given back to him. Since we're seated in Christ in the heavenly places and we're co-heirs with him, we've also been given access to use that authority as if it was our own. It works kind of in the same way that a power of attorney does in the natural. When someone's given the power of attorney by a person, that gives them the legal right to sign the person's name as if they were that person. We have been given the spiritual power of attorney to use, Je to use Jesus's name as if we were him. To be clear, we've been given the authority to use his name, but it's his power, not ours, that does the work. Just the same as signing a check under the power of attorney takes resources out of the person that signed over their power of attorney's account. When we use the authority of Jesus' name, the withdrawal is being taken from his resources, his power, not ours. Paul says in the latter part of our key verse that he does not run the race aimlessly as one beating or boxing the air. What he's referring to here is that he sets his mind in a direction and then continues pressing toward the goal instead of aimlessly going about in the hopes of getting to the finish line. To simplify it even more, he makes a decision. Everything in the kingdom of God begins with a decision. Everything. When you receive Christ as your Savior, you decided, I'm going to receive Christ as my Savior. Everything is a decision. Everything begins with a decision. That's why the Bible says, let a double-minded man receive nothing of the Lord because they haven't decided yet. It's a, we have to decide. We make the decision to humble ourselves before God and to lay down whatever it is holding us back on the altar. Then we make a decision to get back up no matter how many times we fall back into the flaw, mindset, sin, or behavior. We make the decision not to allow the enemy to sow lies and deception in our minds by causing us to fall again and submitting back into a state of bondage. We make the decision to hold on to the truth of God's word no matter what we continue to see happening around us and in us. Much of our walk with God involves intentionality. Praying is an intentional. Worship is intentional. Reading and studying God's word is intentional. Applying God's word by being doers instead of hearers only is definitely intentional. Submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit is intentional, etc. God will never force us to surrender things to him, and he's not going to barge in and just take things from us that are holding us back. It's up to us to partner with God by inviting him into the situation and then submitting to his leadership even when or if we don't understand his methods, which since his ways are so much higher than our ways and his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts, the potential is there to be, you know, more often than we'd like. We can always be assured that he will answer whenever we call, though. That's a promise. God is not interested in having puppets. He waits at the door of our heart and gently knocks until we answer. 
He knocks, but we have to open the door and invite him in. Paul says in the end of that verse that he disciplines his body and keeps it under control so that after preaching to others, he's not disqualified. We have a part in disciplining our fleshly carnal nature. We make the decision to follow God's word and his ways, and Holy Spirit enables us to do it after we step out on our faith on that truth. It's up to us to take the steps and up to the Holy Spirit to empower us to be successful. The more that we step out in faith and then rely on the Holy Spirit to supply whatever it is we're lacking, the more effective we'll be and the closer to the finish line of total freedom we will get. It's a continual decision to submit, surrender, and step out on our faith that the victory on our faith that the victory already belongs to us. Once we arrive at that finish line, we have a powerful and reliable testimony to help others to get through the same or similar things. In my opinion, that's why God generally takes the long way around so that we get to know more about him and ourselves in the process. And our testimony is more effective. Plus, if God takes a longer route to help us to overcome something, we know that we didn't overcome whatever it was in our own strength and ability. And we tend to appreciate it a lot more. There's no denying that it was only, only God that got us through it because we've fallen so many times along the way. Self-discipline in the kingdom of God actually begins with the relinquishing of self and relying instead on the guidance, direction, leadership, and power of the Holy Spirit. We confess whatever it is to God that's been holding us back, and then we partner with him in walking that out until we're walking fully in that victory. This can happen instantly, but could also happen through a process in which God takes us to the manifestation of that victory over a period of time. We should never give up. Never. Because as soon as we laid whatever we were struggling with on the altar, it lost its hold on us. It's our job to cast down any lies or imaginations that the enemy tries to throw at us in order to trick us into submitting once again into the bondage that we've actually been freed from. We get up time and time again, no matter how many times we fall short. We repent of falling short, we receive God's forgiveness, and we cast down the lies that we're not forgiven, and we receive God's cleansing us of all unrighteousness. We keep pressing forward until we're walking in the full manifestation of the freedom that is already ours the moment we gave it over to God. We praise God for the victory along the way. It's already done, so we praise him as if it is. Knowing that no matter how long it takes, we have the victory and a powerful testimony to help others. We give God all of the glory because the, he is the only one deserving of it. We would never be able to get to the finish line without his help. Yeah, God is awesome. And we would not be able to, to get to the finish line and complete everything he has um, put in our lives to do has purposed our lives to do without his help. And the only perfect one is Jesus. So there's no pressure. There's none, no pressure whatsoever because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And that gives us the freedom to, um, I, I always say, you know, um, I think it's Joyce Myers. Meyer, sorry, Joyce Meyer, that says um, progress, not perfection. It's either her or Chris Kane. I'm not sure which one right now. I'm so tired and I can't think of, of which one. But progress, not perfection. Progress, not perfection. I, I know Mama Joyce says that you're not where you used to be. You, you may not be where you want to be, but you're not where you used to be. Celebrate 
that you have grown. Celebrate that you have improved. Celebrate the the steps that you have taken towards wholeness, towards freedom, towards um, progress. Because this is a lifelong process with God. It's fun. It's interesting. It's exciting because we get to know him throughout it all. And that is the point. That's the best part is to know him. And if we never messed up, we would never need his help. The only perfect man on earth is Jesus. That's the only perfect man that has ever lived this earth, Jesus. And he's the only one that will ever walk this earth until he returns. So that means we can all let ourselves off the hook. It doesn't mean that that's a license to do whatever we want or to, you know, just slack off and, and not, um, not press toward the mark and that finish line and being more Christ-like every day. But it does mean the times that we're not. As long as we repent, receive his forgiveness, receive him cleansing us of all unrighteousness, and we get back up and we do better next time, we're fine. We'll be okay. God is awesome. And he loves us so much. And he understands that we will not have perfect execution And we're not expected to. With that being said, I love y'all. And we'll see you next time. Bye.